Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here with us today. My name is Joshua Long, and I serve this as the Senior Educational Content Manager for the Indiana Youth Institute. Today, we are kicking off Indiana Youth Institute's webinar series on emerging careers. Our goal with the series is to equip youth workers with information, resources, and context behind the careers that youth are most interested in. I am very excited about today's webinar because we are diving into an industry that didn't exist at all um, that long ago and one that is cited by YouGov as a dream job for youth today, and that is eSports star or professional streamer. Before we begin and introduce our guests, I'd like to share just a little bit about the Indiana Youth Institute. So who is IYI? We have one goal that never changes. We do it for the kids. We believe that every child counts. When children experience the conditions to thrive, to reach their full potential, our families, communities, and state benefit. We believe in the power of collaboration and partnership, knowing that the ever-changing issue faced by children and youth cannot be tackled in silos. And the success of youth serving professionals and organizations is amplified when connected with other dedicated partners. We believe in constant learning and innovation. Our work is not finished until every child in every part of our state is safe, well-educated, healthy, and supported by caring adults. And so with that, we are just going to jump in um, and I'm going to introduce uh, today's guests. Um, we have Dr. Jerry Gillespie and Stephen Reed from Microsoft. So I'll just turn it over to them to introduce themselves. Please, Jerry. All right. Hello. Welcome. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, I'm so happy to be here. I have um, come from education. I'm an educator. I've been in education for over 25 years. I was a classroom teacher, a building principal, instructional coach. I um, was at a district uh, level of instructional technology. Um, everything that I still do wraps around curriculum instruction and how to empower students. And, and that is why I do what I do. In fact, it was great to see that mission because that is really the mission we follow even with Microsoft in helping support students, educators all achieve more. And that is really why I do what I do in supporting the educators and the students uh, that I work with. Stephen? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Reed. I'm the Game Based Learning Lead at Microsoft under the um, Teaching and Learning Experiences and Engagement Team. And I've been an educator similarly for two decades. And I have focused my education career on helping my peers to use technology for three things three pillars curriculum engagement. Uh, explicit curriculum engagement, uh, social and emotional learning, including what we call teaching the tough stuff, which I'm sure we'll talk about later on, and uh, career, uh, career readiness for, for our students. And really what I've focused on, of all the technologies that I've used, virtual reality, 3D printing, um, you name it, I've really uh, have a passion for gaming. Game, uh, games, gaming, and game-based learning. And I've used over 140 off-the-shelf games to teach students in over 70 countries. That is a good place to start. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I, I kind of just want to jump in by, by talking about the why. Um, I think there's a lot of educators, a lot of youth workers around our state that um, uh, know that our kids love uh, games. They know they love esports, um, but don't necessarily know the language. And so if we can just uh, uh, start by talking about why this matters, um, why it matters for kids, why it can matter for a classroom, why it can matter for our after school program. I think that'd be a good place to start. Well, you know, I'm going to let Stephen jump in and really talk about because he is, I mean, he's a master in, in game based learning, that too. But I can tell you from my own um, personal experience in starting to, school is difficult for me when I first started. I had that one amazing teacher mm -hmm. in sixth grade um, who changed my life. Um, and had, you know, gave me that empowerment and agency to learn how to learn for myself. And that became important to me. So even when I started my career, and I think I've shared with you, Josh, I started in, in, in a youth program. Um, I was a tutor starting at 16 and stayed there throughout to college. Um, it's where I fell in love with education and educating youth and working with youth. And I think that is the essential why and how we are relating and, and really trying to meet students where they are and learners where they're at. 
And that's what we're talking about um, as Stephen goes through and talks about the differences and in, in the foundational uh, pieces that are game-based learning. It comes back to the why we know learning happens. Um, I can go back to, to all the books that I've read and, and what I've had in, in my education and that too, and know what those, those components of good learning are. And that is what you're going to find in, in, in the instructional model of game-based learning. And, and if we think back, even in our own experiences, those are the times where we felt in, in our journeys and our educational journeys and our learning journeys, where we felt empowered, where we were able to be challenged in our thinking, having in those critical thinking aspects, having some choice and agency in what we were doing and being able to master that material and that information. And I, I can talk about in throughout this discussion, I'll talk about how we can make those ties in the community and after school programs. But uh, that is just from myself personally, having gone through and then bringing pieces and parts of this into the classroom as an educator um, has made a difference. But Stephen, why don't you talk about the why and, and the why of game-based learning? <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. So when, I, when I'm asked this question, quite often people will say to me, but why? Why, do, why should we do this? Why should we change our models? Why should our teachers adopt this? Why should our students um, you know, learn in this way? Why do you do what you do around the world? Um, there's actually multiple levels to it, at literally from the macro, uh, sorry, the micro right up to the, 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 the kind of macro. And I'll, I'll talk briefly about both so I don't soak up all the time with this one question. Um, but from a micro uh, perspective, the idea that students students live in this world whether we like it or not students uh, uh, engage now I'm not a fan of the whole digital native conversation because I think that regardless of, of who you are you need to learn and adapt and adopt this stuff but but still it's it's a world that they're they're in and they're used to and they are they're under uh, you know they, they've got their peer systems that kind of put them in that space and place digital I mean there's a fascinating um, video of a little girl now online and she her mom gives her a magazine and the first thing she does is try to pinch the magazine <laughs> she's just a baby she's just like pinching the magazine because she's been watching and learning and thinking technologically for the very short time that she's been on this planet and now she's confused because the magazine doesn't pinch um and that's not i don't think that's necessarily a, a, a slight on the parents or or a problem for the child it's just it's just so natural for them to go hang on how come everything doesn't work like this i was talking to a um a, a class of kids recently and they were amazed that I can remember a time before the internet. They were like, there was never not an internet. I said, yes, there was always not an internet. I didn't grow up with the internet in my school. Um, in fact, I grew up in the 19, I was schooled in the 1970s and 80s when uh, my neurodiversity, which is synesthesia, wasn't even hurt. People weren't even weren't even thinking about it on an educational basis. It was discovered in the late 1800s, but still the school system hadn't adapted to even consider stuff like that. So students like me, much as, as Jerry's um, um, alluded to, students like me were not catered for in that way. Um, and so every student in your classroom on that micro level is engaged somehow. I mean, people say to me, yeah, but game, gaming's just for a bunch of select kids that are in their parents' basements, right? Wearing geek t-shirts. And I say, actually there's 2.5, billion gamers in the world. That's a massive percentage of our overall global population. 60% of Americans play daily, play video games daily. So you might be thinking, well, it's not me, but it's there's 60% of your fellow Americans are picking up a video game. Now, that's not to say that it's Call of Duty or, you know, endless hours of any of the Assassin's Creed or Far Cry series or whatever. It could be Candy Crush Saga on the bus, but that gaming is 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 becoming a norm um and so that that norm is something that our kids are a part of and the one time or the one place in space that they don't get to engage with it talk about it or do anything with it is generally school which incidentally is where they spend hours of their day five days a week sometimes six um, and so actually what we're doing is we're taking something that's fundamental to their their social and emotional and characteristic upbringing. And we're saying, not, 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 not today, not for the few hours that you're with me. Thank you very much for the, for the entire year. And we really need to think about that, which takes me to the macro level. Um, the world is, 
the world is demanding these skill sets through through technological engagement. I'm not talking about the world is necessarily saying in order to work for Microsoft, you better have played on an Xbox at some point, although that would be helpful. Um, but what they're ultimately saying, what, what the world is saying is when you leave school, we expect you to be tech savvy, to work in not just the Microsofts and the Amazons of this world, but to work in offices and to work in admin and to work in HR and to work in so many of the other um, uh, uh, spaces, computer science jobs, cybersecurity, big data, any of the network engineering jobs that are out there, uh, shoutcasting, which we've talked about, esports, um, uh, broadcasting, any sort of community engagement, any of those sorts of jobs that students are going into, and these are the jobs of the 21st century, require require some degree of technological know-how. And so when our students are telling us where their technological passion is, when they're saying, oh, I like to use this technology, we owe it to them to say, how can we help you with that? Oh, games. Let's look at how we can use games to teach you. Know, you. And so we'll talk more about that shortly. Yeah, I think, I think that um, uh, that why is important. And the, the distinction between um, uh, gaming or game-based learning or esports as a novelty versus mm. the reality of our world is is important because um, uh, it, it isn't a novelty anymore. It's something that, like you said, 60% of, of people in America are doing. Um, and so to, when you frame it that way of you're, you're not bringing something into the school that 60% of Americans are doing that nearly every kid is going home and doing, it just doesn't uh, it just no. doesn't make sense. And so, well, and what, sorry, one more thing on that, Josh, mm -hmm. is, is that um, fifth, uh, sorry, 13% of new gamers each year are over 65 plus. And when asked why, you know, there's all sorts of studies that go out and they say, hey, you know, why have you decided at 65 or above to pick up a Nintendo Switch and start connecting or buy your first PlayStation? The answer is almost always so I connect, so I can connect with my children and my grandchildren. And so that, that social and family connectivity is now being recognized uh, uh, by those who are retired and thinking, actually, to make that connectivity, I need to start using this technology. And so we're seeing this constant loop of engagement. You know, yeah. I, I, I want to jump into because it's because we bring up an excellent point, Stephen, about that community. And not only that, Josh, to bring it back to because I when I listen to Stephen talk about this, I can't help but have my leader administrator hat hits in because I swear I spent a lot of majority of my career also was in administration and thinking about that and the why and how we support students and get them to learn. All of my career, most of my career, except for two years, I spent in Title I education here in the U.S., which meant that we really need to look at how we were supporting all students. Every student that walked in that door, we needed to, to, to make sure we were showing up every day to make an impact. And when you look at what Stephen just explained and, and take it back to an instructional model, just any instructional model, you know that you have to have engagement. You have to have that, that feel of safe, that community that Stephen just talked about. Then you have to have engagement, which brings in with game-based learning that too, because you naturally are meeting where students were at, where Stephen just explained. You're making it feel a piece where they understand. So you have that natural engagement, that intrinsic motivation. If I was gonna throw out those education terms that we look for, right? Um, and then you have instant feedback. It's the way we learn. You have the instant feedback that comes back of where you are with clear outcomes. You know what it's going to look like. You're trying to see success and, and you're getting all of that places with those outcomes, which is if I were to step back and take as a leader, as an educator, as anywhere here and say, what do I need? Like, what is that formula to, to create mastery and learning that content where I've empowered students? You're yeah. going to find all those elements. And that's why I support the work, especially that Stephen's doing and, and my educators and what I did in the classroom myself, because I needed at the end of the day, I needed to make sure I was empowering and seeing students to see this from their side and their level, um, it, because it's how we learn. It's how we learn when we were liter when we were younger. We didn't show pictures to, you know, when, when I taught my children how to ride the bike, I didn't show them a slideshow or show the pictures of the bike. We put them on the bike. We put them mm -hmm. in application of it. You know, you know, they fell down, we picked them up, they went, some learned faster. You know, my, my, they learned at all different speeds, but we engaged them in that activity. And that's what we're gonna talk about a lot today. And that's where looking at the work that Steven does, he's really empowering and throwing you know, putting students in, in that mix. 
Yeah, yeah, and I think um, I think maybe some of the hesitation that educators or even after school programs have is, um, but I go back to the novelty, like it still feels like a novelty to a lot of people. So um, I think if we could just talk for a little bit about how um, specifically, uh, well, specifically what is game-based learning and what's the difference between esports, but then also um, what are some ways to incorporate it into a classroom um, that I guess would I would say is pedagogically um, uh, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, so significantly, what I tend to, if people are watching this and thinking, yeah, how do I get my head around this? How should I be talking about this? How should I formulate this in my mind um, so that we can move forward with it structurally? The way I always look at it is game based learning is the umbrella under which we find you know, those or on which we find those segmented sections. So when we talk about game-based learning, we talk about the use of games. And now this is different from gamification. So actually I'll start by just saying, if we take gamification, that is the art of taking almost anything that anyone does and then putting game rules into it so that you create levels and you create rewards and you create um, systems of achievement. Um, so gamifying something is different. When we talk about game-based learning, we talk about the learning that takes place while playing. Um, significantly, of course, we can talk about board games, etc. Um, we can even talk about playing in the playground physically, um, climbing on climbing frames and so on. But when we talk about game-based learning, we tend to talk about digital game-based learning and, and, and playing with video games. And so when, I, again, I, I hear it all the time, people say to me, so come on, come on, talk to me. Like, what, what, you're telling me we can learn maths and science and history and literacy in video games? And yes, absolutely we can. Um, as well as a whole bunch of other things, like for example, when you're playing video games, your brain is naturally making thousands of decisions a second. Um, and there's all sorts of amazing uh, papers out there that, that talk about the science of gameplay, digital gameplay. But, but my passion and my way of kind of formulating this for teachers is that we're not talking about playing games and then sort of surreptitiously kind of pulling the learning out. We plan ahead. We say we are going to use a very specific game in a very specific way to teach literacy today, or we are going to use a very specific genre of game in a very specific instructional practice to teach history of World War II this month. Um, and so it's that way of being able to use games to, to teach. Within that then comes, well, let's do that as esports. And quite often people talk about esports in education. Esports in education is easy. You if you've got the wherewithal, you can set up some PCs, you can stick your kids into groups and you can have them compete. Um, that's not to take anything away from anyone doing esports and education. It's a wonderful thing. But where we are very passionate is in esports as education, when esports is the education, when we're teaching specifically about teamwork and collaboration and fair play and good competition and articulation of uh, leadership skills and so on and so on within an esports context. Or the very act of doing esports is the assessment of biology this month using our Minecraft, Minecraft make and model series, for example. Um, or when mentioning the third pillar that I talked about earlier, when esports becomes specific to career management so we are going to run an esports program and yes you're going to have lots of fun with it and you're going to compete and win prizes but actually what we're really focusing on is curating pathways that will lead you into broadcasting or pathways that will lead you into uh, administration or management or marketing or business you know running your own business entrepreneurship for example um, and so game-based learning is the umbrella under which we find things like esports um, uh, as a as a part of the the theory of the practice of play based or game based learning. And and you go back to the why again. If I came back and said, well, why do I want to do this in my classroom? Why you know in in what Stephen just said is because we do this a lot even in our own teaching practices, and we don't even realize it. But what, what happens when you put students in that place, when I see students, act, like, for example, with Minecraft, um, we have an amazing role that Stephen um, helped put together that we talk about a lot, like with League of Literacy is, is a world in Minecraft that, that supports comprehension and, and reading skills and that too. But what happens just as you can see is automatically learners become that role in, in where it is in that space. 
they now take on a whole different dimension in how they're thinking and, and those decisions we're making. As Stephen said, you know, all those decisions that they're making in that digital world, they, that becomes a purposeful for them. It becomes an agency that they now have choice, they now gotten in, and there becomes um, an understanding of why they're doing things themselves. And these are natural processes that just happen in the brain as they're learning, because they've taken on that role of where they are within um, that, that tool that you're using. So it's another piece of that kind of instructional model. And I think that's what Stephen's saying. It's not just a strategy. It's not just taking in, and I've seen it too, you know, classes where you might have a quiz game at the end, where you're trying to study. That That's that's different about, you know, piece of that's that gamification piece that Steven's talking about. That's something that maybe you're trying to check for feedback in that versus actually having a space where students can take on some of these responsibilities, these roles and being able to use these skills and having a purpose for using these skills because it's a different mindset when they come in to learn and what that looks like. And, and honestly, when I talk to educators and I, I see the light bulbs go on, especially when they're listening to Stephen, they realize that they're doing a lot of this already. It's just making that transition to being intentional. What Stephen said, that, that, first piece, that first piece, the planning and being intentional and understanding that. Um, and I can always see when that clicks on in educators, like in their brains and their eyes light up because they realize and they can contact, connect to a lot of the pieces that they're already doing and, and especially in school communities and how this is you know extending and, and becoming an outreach for for those that are getting involved too yeah and one of the just to just to piggyback on onto that briefly and, and, I, and I'll, I'll avoid going down my usual rant about this <laughs> but all of this rests in the value of play and how we as adults fail largely now to value play um and and just to just to clarify what i mean by that is there's if we think about this for a moment, if you stop and think about the last time you intentionally played as an adult, and I mean intentionally played with no purpose, intentionally climbed a tree, or just went out on your bike and it wasn't for sport, or to, or to get somewhere, or the last time you just idly kicked a ball around that wasn't with the intention of scoring a goal, or, you know, it's like, from a very young age, we start to tell children that, and it's, a, and it's a frighteningly young age, we start to tell children that there was a time for play, but it's done now. And now you're, now you're in school and it's serious now. And the only time you can play is during the break. You've got 15 minutes and you can do what you like. And then, and even then we set rules. And then when the bell goes, you're going to come back in and it's back to work. And we're telling children that from a very young age. And then we are, and then we're amazed to find a study in 2020 um, showed that 84% of parents don't know how to meaningfully play with their children worldwide. Play is being lost on us. And so, and yet when we did play, when we were kids, that's where all of our learning took place. We learned about our space and we learned about our body and we learned about our emotions and we learned about our abilities and we learned all of this stuff. And then we were told, now you're going to go and learn serious stuff and you, you're going to do it with a pen and paper and a book. And, 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 and the world suddenly changed. Um, and so if we can get back to that beautiful play based nature um, as educators, we will find that that's where the magic still is. That's where the students are still learning. Um, and so um, that's 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 where I often start is from the basis of why do we play? Therefore, how does game-based learning help us? Yeah, yeah, I love that. And I, I love that um, uh, there's obviously a place for this uh, in, in schools for content, whether it's history, literacy, mm -hmm. math, et cetera. But um, it seems like both of you are hitting on, uh, hitting on the fact that, that play and game-based learning and games are also a place to build, um, I guess, what, what I would call soft skills. Um, Jerry, you mentioned choice and agency again and again. And I think even as a parent or as a, as a former educator, um, the thing that I that I wanted to do or that I want to do as a parent is create a safe space for my kid to learn and to fail and to grow because I think that's where the choice and agency come from. And yeah. I think, it, you know, I, I, I'm not a, a huge gamer, but I play Rocket League a lot and I certainly fail all the time in that in a way that isn't consequential to my own life. So um, I just think it's a, a really a really cool place to learn failure so that you can build that choice and agency. Um, mm -hmm. And just uh, yeah, if you have anything else in regards to the, the soft skills, I think that's a kind of a, um, uh, an emerging issue in, in education, whether it's soft skills or SEL or all that kind of stuff. Oh, absolutely. Uh, um, if you don't mind, Jerry, I'll, I'll 
Yes, I'll take this exactly. one. Um, the, the development, I mean, games by their very nature encourage students either to develop a huge range of those. I mean, I, I say there's nothing soft about them. They're hard, right? It's hard to learn to be emotionally adapt. Uh, sorry, adept. It's hard to learn to be strong in a situation in which you are the um, you you are you are being bullied, for example. It's hard to learn to speak up for yourself and advocate for yourself. These are hard skills, but um, but they're hard skills to learn. But ultimately, they kind of sit in the background of what we call the explicit curriculum. Um, and so, games by their very nature especially very well crafted because remember if you're looking for a lot of teachers say to me I can't find a resource that can help me teach this and I say do you know that there are game developers whose only job and they're and they're brilliant at it there's artists and musicians and all sorts of wonderful people coders that and their only job is to figure out how to create a game like Age of Empires which teaches explicitly American state history and the expansion into the West. And they go, really? And I say, and it's one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen, but you didn't consider it because it wasn't a learning resource um, or you didn't see it as a learning resource until we, you know, and these people are out there getting paid to do it, um, to develop these. Um, all we have to do is make the transition between the tool as it was made and the intention we have for it. Um, and so, um, whether whether we know it or not, these games are designed to help students to develop a huge range of these social and emotional skills, if you like, including everything from the you know sound judgments, informed decisions, uh, uh, multiple decision uh, making, um, solving quandaries, uh, complex quandaries in some case between um, not just fellow players, because much of this is multiplayer, and they have all these. These, these sort of connections with the communities and the and the players that there are I play a lot of multiplayer games and it's and it's it's amazing to have to negotiate and plan and strategize with other people that might be 2000 miles away you know I play with people in Indonesia and South Africa and and and, and we bring our our sort of combined uh, cultural intellect together to, to kind of do these things but also um, including through language barriers but also with what we call non-player characters with game elements. So sometimes the student can just be playing in a game against the computer and it's the computer that's providing the challenge. It's the computer that's making them measure their frustration levels. It's the, it's the computer that's making them feel good today because they achieved. It's the computer that made them laugh for the first time in three weeks under COVID duress because for the first time in three weeks, they, 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 they had a meaningful experience with someone or something in the game environment. And so what we're finding is that these games are actually helping us to, to, to develop those social and emotional uh, skills uh, within the gaming environment. And just to give you one very brief example, uh, Jerry and I received an email a while ago after we'd launched our esports program in South Africa from uh, a couple, a, a, a parenting couple, and they wrote an email to us that said, just wanted, I hope you don't mind, sorry we looked you up, um, but we just wanted to thank you so much for your esports program. Your, this program single-handedly pulled our son out of a hole we didn't think he was going to get out of. He wasn't getting out of bed, he wasn't bath, you know, showering, he wasn't eating, uh, certainly not nutritiously, he was, he was permanently depressed and angry and and just in a such a bad place and then your esports program came along and he kind of joined in online wasn't sure if he was going to enjoy it now he's bouncing out of bed early he's practicing he's doing his homework because he knows that if he doesn't do his homework he can't compete in the esports competition he's connecting with people he's never met before on three separate continents he's like this program has saved our son's life and and that's really something that I'm you know, we get we get nice emails, but that's a big one for us. Yeah. Is is like we're pulling children into into social and emotional situations that that might 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 be saving their life. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And, and Dutch, even even the social emotional aspects we talk about are as, like that was such a great example. You know, you have those aspects, but you also have those aspects that are so abstract. If I go in any school still today, in fact, they were all over my class or my school, you're going to find posters and, and just messages about responsibility, about empathy, about perseverance, about grit, all of these abstract ideals 
for it, it it's difficult to, for young minds to understand and to see that at a concrete level, what that looks like. And that is also another space where you were talking about those soft skills that are essential because it's those metacognitive skills, those thinking about thinking and how, how do I have students understand about their learning, about how they're, they're, they're adjusting, how they know they have agency. And, and it's difficult to be able to really teach those as an educator. And again, we're in a space now when we're using these tools, when we use this instructional model, we now have a, a tool to help the something that's really abstract become concrete for us to have those discussions. The discussions are, are critical because that's what happens. It ties and helps students transfer that learning that's happening. And so when yeah. you mention those soft skills, that's exactly what's happening. They're, they're not only learning about, you know, the support and the social emotional support that Stephen talked about, but they're learning about, you know, those those examples where they can be empathetic, especially in a game. There's a game that Stephen talks about where it is always about thinking about what happens on the other side and the choices you make, because now you have something where they can understand what that means. I, I was an intermediate teacher, so I had to teach things like theme, you know, and plot and foreshadowing and these mm -hmm. really, you know, abstract ideas to to 11, 10, you know, 12 year olds. And, and so all educators out there and really understand can relate to what I'm talking about. And it's difficult to get them in that space. So having an instructional model like this, what we're talking about and using these digital tools is what evens yeah. out the playing field. And, and I'm, you know, I come back and it's the reason why I'm at Microsoft because I believe in, I believe in what um, these tools can do because I'm always about the why first and what it is that we're learning. What are we trying to impact that always comes first? How are we yeah. trying to support here? Um, I believe in what these tools do because when you put them together, you know, when you have when you have Minecraft and able to, to create this world, uh, Minecraft with education, and then you have Flipgrid that adds in that student voice and you bring it all together in teams that holds and connects all of that. You know, all of these pieces and tools support what you just talked about because it's really about how do we support all of those soft skills in, in creating this learner because the yeah. content is going to come. You know, the, the content's there. In fact, there are, is so much information out there then when I speak to my own um, adult children, I've, I've got young adult children, they know things I did not know or, you know, that I taught, you know, uh, 15 years ago that have changed just because of the information that's available out there. So it's it's those types of, um, you know, soft skills and learning about learning and be able to really have students feel empowered to make that choice and what that looks like. And what Stephen hit on earlier, having that digital literacy, knowing how to use these tools to get where they want is, is really what makes a difference too. So I, I think that was a powerful question and a and, and really important conversation of why, again, why um, this is something and, and, and how esports and how game-based learning can really support what you're doing to empower students. It's a great, just uh, one, one last point on this is actually a challenge to teachers is if you're watching this and you're thinking, I wanna see that in action, get your students to do a piece of creative writing. And then after they've done it, say, tell me why you wrote that. Tell me, tell me about that. And, and we've done this and they, and they kind of mumble their way through it. And they go, well, I kind of, you told me to write this. So I kind of did that. Well. And they kind of mumble their way through it. Then get them to build something in Minecraft, anything. And then say, tell me why you built it like that. And they will, they will not shut up about how they built it and why they built it and why they built it there and the material that they used and the importance of the structure and, and why this door leads to there to get to the, like the, the ability for them to advocate and process and reflect and analyze and then and then vocalize those those analytics like it's incredible and and if we can take that from a minecraft example and we can transfer it back to their creative writing practice or back, back to their mathematical um, you know, problem solving practice, then we're really on to something. So challenge to teachers, try it. Yes, because yeah. that is what happens. It, it, <laughs> I have seen it too. <laughs> yeah, and that's, um, I think that's the embodiment of the agency you were talking about, right? Being able yeah, yeah. to have an idea, to put it on paper, to put it on Minecraft and then, and then properly communicate it to the world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just a couple more things on uh, uh, game-based learning before we sort of transfer over to esports and, and careers. Um, the first is I just, uh, I, I, I want to um, uh, help educators um, be able to do some of this stuff in the classroom. And so uh, there's there's just so much. I think about um, 
uh, uh, the idea of um, grief and death and how there's a game called Spirit Fair that came out a couple of years ago that is, that is just an incredibly beautiful game that even helped me um, sort of think through death and grief. And so I just, hmm. I think there's something out there for whatever situation a teacher might be in. Um, but if you guys could just point um, point our educators, our youth workers to some resources around this, um, just talk it out and then um, we'll put a uh, Put links to them in the show notes on game-based learning specifically, and then we'll move into esport careers. Sure, I mean the the, the spirit fader game is just beautiful. It's about the, the, the it's kind of like a, a transition. You're, you 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 have the boat, and it's about transitioning from life to death. Um, but there's also, I mean, there's a whole plethora of games that you can play, like that Dragon Cancer, which won all sorts of awards. It was actually kickstarted, and it's about a father. Uh, and it's a the true story of a father who became a game developer because his son died of cancer and he wanted to, tragically, his young, young son passed away of cancer and he wanted to tell the story of that journey and he called it That Dragon Cancer. Um, and it's all about and telling the boy about the dragon and, and it's just it's wonderful. Life is Strange is another um, game to check out, which actually puts you back in college as a young girl in a Pacific Northwest college as a photography student. Um, if you play something like What Remains of Edith Finch, which is about loss, the loss of family members. Um, and, and losing someone and then having to deal with that loss. If you look at something like Never Alone, that's about cultural identity. Um, and it's about a little um, Inuit boy who gets lost in a snowstorm and you have to play through the snowstorm to kind of find your way back to your village. But it's not about the snowstorm at all. It's about the loss of language and the loss of culture and the loss of clothing, food, currency, you know, religion, all the things that we lose when our when our culture is stripped from us. Um, if you look at something like um, Please Knock on My Door, which is a game about um, literally being depressed in a one bedroom flat and wishing someone would knock on your door, but not really because you're suffering from depression um, and, and, and so on. There's just so many wonderful, wonderful resources out there that you can pick up when you start to look into that side. And that's just a few that I've, um, that I've explored um, with you. But yeah, we can, um, we can certainly make uh, links and resources available um, um, to you. Sorry, one more that's worth mentioning is Gris, G-R-I-S, uh, which is a beautiful game that never explicitly talks about female empowerment and uh, girls becoming women and moving into that um, sort of space in their life where they now have uh, advocacy as women. Um, but it's about that. It's about gender, gender equality, equity and justice um, and, and that sort of transition for women, which is beautiful. I played it as a male and I got it and I understood it and I felt it. And it, and it makes me as a man reflect on a woman's world. Um, and so games can move us. I mean, they really can move us. And so um, we'll, we'll, we'll help with all of that. But then if you're looking at explicit games, if you want to, I mean, we've talked about Minecraft, but, you know, there's people out there teaching civics uh, and there's a game called Democracy 4, um, 3 or 4, but Democracy 4 has just been released where your students can literally micromanage an entire democracy from the ground up. Um, I've actually never managed to make a successful one yet. I think people think I'm a communist or something, but I can't actually make a democracy work. Um, there's um, any of the city builders like City Skylines, um, where a recent um, study in Europe showed that 94% of people who are in town planning or architecture or some sort of um, city, city uh, civics role um, attributed their direction in life to playing Sim City when they were younger. They mentioned it as part of their overall interview um, in the thing. There's Planet Zoo, where you can not just run a zoo, but you can learn in great detail about every single detail of the most endangered species on our planet. I mean, teachers all over the world are trying to teach that stuff right now, but they're not using Planet Zoo to do it. And it's beautiful. It's incredible. Um, and so, I, you know, we've used Civilization, Age of Empires, From Dust, Little Big Planet, Universe Sandbox, where you can quite literally learn about every piece of mathematics and physics about the universe. Um, you can play with planets and change their mass. Um, or change their, their, their point in the, in the universe and then watch the whole thing fall apart and realize just how lucky we are to live on Earth. But um, 
but all of these games are available um, at the touch of a button if you um, if you start looking into it. So I'll provide that list and more. And then what we can do is we can also provide some uh, more resources around game-based learning for you. Yeah, and, and I want to come back to this about especially something that Steve said earlier in here. It's about that intentional planning, right? Yeah. So, so it's always thinking about what it is in your outcomes and your learning in, in what it is that you want students to be able to walk away with. What are the what are the skills? What is the learning? What is it that you want them to be able to master and come back to that first, right? So um, I was one, I've always believed in Minecraft. In fact, Stephen knows this. I, when Minecraft before it even was part of Microsoft and Minecraft education, I went you know, years ago, we're talking probably a decade ago, um, to the school board and really asked and advocated for uh, an educator in my building. I had a teacher in my building who wanted to use it um, to teach um, Western expansion in Oregon Trail. And mm. so, um, and, and it was important because he wanted to put these elements in there. And we went we, we went, and we were able to, to bring that in the classroom, but he had a purposeful reason of what it was in those outcomes. Because I've also been on that side when I was a district and, and was the administrator and, and executive of all of our instructional technology. I would, off, I would have educators come and say, hey, you know, I know students are engaged. I want to meet them where they're at. I want to bring, I want to use this app. I saw this app, it's really cool. How, you know, how does this app tie to what I'm doing? That, that, that's what you don't want to do. You actually, want to come in and you want to look at what it is that you want your students to accomplish and be intentional in that planning like what Steven said earlier it, it's using these games for that intentional purpose mm -hmm. at the end because you know you're not of course students are going to come naturally to the plate like we talked about natural play you know we all like to play when, when especially when Stephen brings up that about go climb a tree and kick a ball and in those things and I'm even more aware of myself times that I will just on my own downtime will go you know go out and and just throw the ball around or, 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 you know, go play, go play a game of, of, you know, with my daughter or that too. So you're just being more cognizant of what it is that you're doing and, and, and really tying in to that learning, but we have resources we can bring out there. There is some really great nonprofit organizations that support um, this kind of learn through play and, and actually trying to incorporate this that we can also share that are partners with Microsoft in this work also, um, that we can also share those resources. But I, I just want to throw that out there first and, and really thinking about um, what it is you want to accomplish. There is a game out there like Steven, I, I don't know, I think you have one presentation. I think you've got like 144 games, I think, it right? Yeah, there's something for everything. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, perspective. Um, let's transfer now into to esports and, and more of the career side. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually think there's uh, there's two routes here, um, which I realized while you were you were speaking. I think um, uh, gaming as a um, as a path to career exploration in general um, is something that I've been hearing. Um, but then also just um, uh, what does a career in esports look like? Um, you know, <laughs> as a like top streamer i'm on twitch i'm gaming but also just all the other things that go into esports and video games as well um yeah. so we can start there yeah i mean so there's two ways i tend to look at this when i'm working in schools um with with customers and that is that it, the first is esports is a route to is, a, is an entire industry and therefore a route to many different careers um you, you know a lot of people say oh you mean our kids are all going to be professional players and i say no 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 some of them will just be coaches as in i say just be coaches some of them will not play the game they will coach teams to play the game because their skill set is different and don't get me i mean they will play the game but they won't necessarily be one of the champion six that are playing the game they'll be the coach of the champion six there's also people that then shout cast which is to um commentate uh, as you would a boxing match or a or a or a or American football match or whatever. Um, there's also people that arrange all of the technology that sits behind it, like hosting, uh, game hosting um, and stuff like that. There's event management. I mean, I, I, if I, is it okay if I share my, can I share my screen? Um, I can allow you to share your screen. Just actually, I can do that. I can do it right now. Oh, cool. Um, so just very briefly, I just want to share um, a slide. Let me just open it. There we are. Uh, and then I'll share my screen. I just want to show you when people say, yeah, but esports events like are not like football events, right? Or 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 hockey events. Um, if I go into the thing now and I just share here, this is an example. Uh, you all see that? 
Uh, great. This is an example mm -hmm. of the international in 2019 uh, with $34 million prize pool. There were 18 teams and 90 players. And this was in Shanghai in China. And you might say to yourself, well, of course, of course, you're going to get you're going to fill a stadium like that. That's 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 Shanghai, China. But my next slide shows Paris in France with a population roughly the same as the UK. And that was the League of Legends 2019 finals with $2.5 million prize pool, 24 teams and 120 players. And we are literally filling stadiums with hundreds of thousands of people watching other people playing video games. But I, when I talk to the kids about this, when I often talk to the students, I say to them, what do you see there? And they say, loads of people watching esports. And I say, think, you know, think, think, look deeper. And then they start to come up with it. Someone, there are lighting engineers, there are technicians, sound technicians, there are stage creators, there are safety, there's security, there's someone's catering that. You know, that it's, it's in, there are shoutcasters. It's incredible the, num the sheer number thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs just to make that real um, and just to make that happen. And so that's, um, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the ways we can look at it. The other is things like um, you've got administration, you've got journalism, like the whole journalism piece that's around this. There's magazines, there's online spaces, you know, online um, journalism spaces. It's incredible. There's video editing, photography. Josh, uh, you and I are both streamers. In fact, Jerry is too. We run a stream called EduY. Um, there's community management. Uh, I, I was talking to a kid the other day and he said, do you have community managers? And I said, me personally. And he said, no, Microsoft. And I said, at Microsoft, we have many community managers for huge communities and they are paid full time to manage these communities and the kid was like I would love that job right because this kid is a community manager on discord and wants to wants to progress there are jobs at Microsoft for that kid and so that's just the roles in esports the second part is then the wider uh, piece which when we when we give our students opportunities to work in the esports space and to be in the esports space they're also developing skills for a wider variety of careers in technology. So you've got things like uh, I mentioned earlier, cybersecurity, cloud solutions, mobile technology, artificial intelligence, coding, UX design, virtual reality, like all of this stuff. Um, I often quote uh, a story about a, a, a fellow that I now, uh, he, he wrote to me at 14 years old, I ran a company and we did loads of events around the UK and, and Europe. And there was one game and uh, one, uh, sorry, one event in particular called the Insomnia Gaming Festival, which was the biggest in Europe. 40,000 people arrived every, uh, every weekend. It was a four day weekend. And this 14 year old wrote to me, dear Mr. Reed, I like playing games and I have seen your stream. And I wondered, I know you're at Insomnia, can I come and help? So I wrote back to him and said, if you, if I can make this connection with your parents, then I would love to have you along. Thank you so much for asking. That young man is now, he came and helped and he was actually struggling at school and he left school early. He left school at 16 instead of, instead of 18, which, um, but through helping us and doing the Insomnia Gaming Festival three times a year and be in our net, I said to him, what can you do? And he said, I like networks. I said, great, network all the PCs that I'm going to be working with this weekend and so on and so on. He's now hugely successful in one of the UK's largest telecommunications companies. Um, he's managed, he's 20, what would that be? I think he's 22 now and he's managing a team of 15 people. Like he's accelerated and and I, I bet if you asked these teachers that have said, oh, Josh, he's, he's incidentally called Josh as well, that have said, oh, Josh, yeah, he's, he's, he's a struggling kid. No, he's not. He just wasn't engaged. He just wasn't, it just wasn't relevant to him. And what did he do? He reached out at 14 um, um, to say, that's where I want to go. Can you help me? And we did. Um, and so, you know, and, and there's and the general sort of roles like marketing, sales, advertising, branding, merchandising, media, event management, we talked about, there is so much. So there's the two strands. There's the, do I want to do this directly? Or will this give me the skills to work somewhere else that is equally as relevant? That's the way I tend to look at it. When you look at when we talk about careers, and a lot of times I, I in fact, I'm on a career panel right now. I'm in New York. <laughs> I'm on a career panel right now for the for the um, New York Department of Ed. They're, they have a tech summit, and I am on a career panel to talk about this kind of things. And but when we talk about careers, um, especially from a parent, even from a parent perspective, from an educator perspective, we're talking about how do we make these young people go from consumers to producers. 
we need them to produce, right? M myself, Josh, you mentioned your own your own kids, right? And myself, I have adult children now. I'm, I've got my, my daughter, my baby. She's finally, she's a senior in high school. I am thinking, how is she going to produce income for herself? Because I, of course, am not going to support my children. <laughs> rest of my life, right? So, <laughs> but as educators, we want to instill those skills and have them produce. Um, when I was a building principal, I used to tell my educators, I used to tell my teachers, um, the students should be working and producing as much as you are. You, they should be working as much as you as the educator because we want them to produce, get in and, and to be able to create things and develop things because that's where they see what that looks like and they have that reflection and that awareness. To have true learning, you have to get to a space of reflection. Like you've got to be able to see what I did and, and be proud of that. That's that agency we've been talking about. So when we look at even careers in esports, like what Steven said, there's multiple careers available. And here we talk about with Microsoft and, and why these skills are so essential is that we can't just have everyone, you know, like we, we talked about Xbox, can't have everybody just, you know, always consuming Xbox. We're going to need some producers. We're going to need some mm -hmm. people in there. We're going to need people that do art, the music that, you know, that come in and do not only the, the, a lot of times the computer science aspects, but there are hundreds of careers that support these games. Um, like you, you mentioned uh, some of the games here today that just have beautiful art scenes in them and the music that's behind it too. Yeah. So even those students that are, you know, are a different realm because a lot of times when we, we you know, we've had those earlier discussions when we talked about STEM and everybody said, well, hey, what about the arts? You know, it became STEAM. Again, using those acronyms that we use in education and that too. Well, it, well, it, I'm going to just, I'm going to kind of open this up to, yeah, it's always encompassing everybody's entrance, their strengths and what it looks like. Um, you know, for a long time, we talked about, you know, that students are going to have these jobs in the future that they don't even weren't even invented yet or weren't created, weren't developed. And, and it was something, um, you know, that really came real life to even myself, because when my oldest son graduated college, he went into a profession. Um, he was uh, someone who posted for an auction company online and his his job really literally did not exist when he graduated from high school. You know, so four years later, this was a profession, this was a job. And I think we are in the same realm when we talk about esports. And I think we we can't close it down like what Stephen said. And we can't be really narrow about, you know, just those people in the state, but we got to look at the whole picture. Um, we have programs in even with um, within right now, if you go on Microsoft Learn, there's an educator CERN center and it talks about Minecraft and it will walk you through a teacher academy. But there is something there even called the student ambassador program for Minecraft. And it talks mm -hmm. about how to empower students to create these clubs, to create these experience and opportunities using Minecraft that are doing exactly the skills we're talking about. How do you, they're, they're using these to develop those career skills, those um, soft skills in, mm -hmm. in students to become ambassadors for Minecraft. But, but they can become ambassadors for anything because really what you're teaching are the skills behind what, what is needed. That's what Steven was talking about when he talked about, um, you know, the person who came, that that young man who came and helped him and now is a successful in the that strengths that he's, that he's doing right now and the skills that he learned in that, in his experience, that we have programs set up for that right mm -hmm. now with tools to get teachers started if they wanted to, even for like, especially youth organizations, you know, talking about this extension, they can go on to Microsoft Learn and, and learn about the student ambassador program that's there and it walks them step by step about how how to create these kind of programs. I am. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, go ahead, Stephen. Nope. Uh, well, I just, just I often talk about, I came from very small town, uh, working class Scotland. In fact, my town's not even worth searching on the internet. It just might as well not exist. And I went to school with um, a young kid. He was a year, he was a year younger than me. He went to school with my brother. Wonderful artist, great, great, great kid. But if you think there's 7 billion, eight, almost 8 billion people on the planet, art is fiercely competitive. But he is now one of the chief artists at uh, Rockstar, and he designs the character concepts for each of the new Grand Theft Auto games. And when I was driving through, not that I necessarily think you should use Grand Theft Auto in school, I'm just putting that out there. But um, but when but one day we were driving, I, I was giving him a lift, um, and we were driving through the middle of the city, um, in London, and I and and his artwork was on this huge building. It was like it was it was inconceivably huge copy of his artwork that had been draped over this multi-story building to launch uh, to 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 laud the launch of the new the game the new game and I and I pointed up and I said to him is that your artwork and he just 
completely nonchalantly went, yeah. And I said to him, don't you think that's amazing that your artwork is draped over a multi-story building in London? And he went, hmm. And it was so funny because to him, it's just normal. To him, he's probably sick of looking at it because that's his job. But but to think of this, you know, the, 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 the almost barely, the, the, the tiniest, grittiest, dirtiest little town in Scotland. And this is where his, his artwork is being on display all over the world, incidentally. It would have been in Times Square as well. Um, it, was, it was hugely, you know, multi, multi, multi billion dollar game. Um, and that's, and so from humble beginnings, and I often say that to teachers, I say, you don't know, and, and I know teachers get this, but you just never know what that little kid in your class is going to end up doing in this wonderful world of of, of new technology and games and game-based learning. I often remember the really grumpy Mr. Do Mr. Wisher, say, my teacher, saying to me, what do you want to be when you leave school, son? And I was like, can you imagine if I'd said to him in the 1980s, I, when I grow up, I want to teach teachers how to use games all over the world to teach. He would have been like, away and work in a bank or something, son. But here we are. So you just never know. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's really powerful. And um, I, I've, I've picked up a theme sort of across this uh, webinar so far. Um, uh, one thing that we've been at, at Indiana Youth Institute have been working with uh, uh, in the last year or so is this, the concept of opportunity youth it used to be called transitional youth. Mm -hmm. um, and opportunity youth is um, youth age 16 to 24 that are not engaged in either work or school. Um, it's about 10% of the youth population. Um, an interesting thing is, is the word opportunity in there. And, and I'm just, I, I'm hearing different ways that esports and game-based learning can provide that opportunity to youth that, that might not be engaged. Um, Stephen, the, the, the child from South Africa is the perfect example of that, right. about how he might've been in that 10% if it weren't for this game program. Um, yeah. Or um, uh, Josh, uh, the other student you had is, is actually the perfect example where he was not doing well in school, um, but this gave him that opportunity. Um, and so um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the opportunities that that game-based learning esports can provide to kids now. Like how do we plug them in? Um, the student ambassador program, Jerry, was a great example of that. Um, but if we could just sort of touch on, touch on that a little bit before we um, start to wrap up. Mm, Jerry. Yeah, so that's actually a part of the trip that I'm here now, too, is to talk about how to connect what's happening in the schools to these after school programs. And, and I, to me, um, when I look back again, putting on my building principal administrator hat, this for me would be low lying fruit, what I call it, like easy things that I could do to connect my school community and the work we're doing to those organizations and youth programs I used to work with. Um, because of my background and where I came from and the youth organization I worked with, for um, to get into education, those have always been top of mind for me as an educator. And then as I went into administration as a building leader, how am I use, utilizing those programs and after school programs, especially in organizations to help support what I'm trying to accomplish in the building? Um, is that extension and not, you know, not passing along the flashcards or other things, you know, on to, to work on our homework help, but how do we really engage inside a culture so that students are still feel welcomed and want to be there and, and feel involved. You, so, for example, when I was in my in the space when I worked in a youth program, um, I had students, I had to learn to help teach, you know, read. They were learning to read again. In fact, I had one little girl, I will never forget, she was held back in first grade um, and she didn't know her letter sounds and that too. And the teacher kept giving me these letter cards and you know what, what students don't want to do is they don't want to go from school and then come to their after school program and then all of a sudden have to do flashcards and, and you know an extension of that to, 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 they want to play especially yep. when myself in my example you know I had a, a six-year-old first grader actually she was seven because she'd been held back um I, I I wanted to look at ways that I could get her engaged to learn so I used to tell her you know you're the teacher you're going to teach me how to read and so we would do different ways and I even had her have to to educate other counselors and and what we had in program in, in, in our space we were and she actually by that year they moved her back into second grade and I still have the letter that her teacher wrote me about how much that impact and changed her life and that was you know that another piece of where I became in my kind of journey in education so keeping that idea there and wanting to support what you're talking about Josh like those, that opportunity for youth is is getting them engaged where if they're already disengaged 
we know that they already don't feel part of the system. They already don't feel part of the community. There is something that is not relating to them because that's that first step also we talked about with community. So how do we engage and bring them in esports and meeting them at is the, is the first step in, in getting them to even be aware or to actually open that door and create that opportunity. Uh, I mentioned that student ambassador program. It talks about that in that program. It talks about how do you set up a program that welcomes students where you're teaching them how to empower themselves and how to make these choices. But then how do you initially engage with them when they already feel that they have are a part of a system that doesn't relate to them um, it, or that they don't fit in? And that's that piece that's so important in education is that we need to make them feel welcome. So when you're talking about these youth organizations and groups, that's that's essentially what I've always wanted to do. So how to make that connection between the schools that we have so that students feel welcome and want to participate in these programs that are happening after school. Um, and, and again, esports is a great way to do that. It also helps within those conversations. I know um, I'm meeting with a group about the different games and how they're using Minecraft is a great a great pathway because you have Minecraft for education that's happening in schools. So you could already go throughout Indiana. You could find those schools that are or want to or starting to use Minecraft in, in looking at and it can become a bridge to those after school programs and youth program that's just a stepping stone to talk about that same similar information and then try and engage those students um, that are even older. Now, when we say Minecraft, and this is too, a lot of times people think it's for um, those younger students, but but Stephen, what it, what's the average age of a Minecraft? of a Minecraft? Uh, the average age of a Minecraft player is in their late 20s, uh, mid yeah. to late 20s. Yeah. Um, yeah. And average, my, uh, sorry. And I was going to say my, my friends and I still every few months will pull up a new Minecraft world. So yes. yeah, exactly. Yes. And run a server yeah. or something. Yeah. When you talk that 16 to 24 in that opportunity, um, that's a, a great stepping stone. But that that's where I would say is those finding those relatable connections. And I know Steven's got a lot more great ideas to bring that in. But esports is, is going to be a space where you can make those students feel like mm. they're they're accepted again, that they're wanted and they, they feel welcome. Actually, all I was going to add um, is empowerment, empowerment, empowerment. Give it to the kids. This is their world. They already, I mean, the number of times where kids have said, I say to the kids, you want to set up a, we're going to set up a club and they go, right, what kind of club? And I say to them, well, you tell me. And they go, well, if it's anything like my Discord server, it needs to have, and then off they go. And then, and then I'll say to them, uh, we're going to need uniforms. And they go, oh, I've got an idea for a, a logo. I've got an idea for a brand. I know where we can get t-shirts. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Empowerment. Now, obviously, we need to cater for and manage and 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 make sure that they're not blowing the the budget. But but if you can if you can empower the students, that's the biggest success for game based learning or esports. Um, quite often when I'm working in schools, I'll say to I'll say to um the kids uh, when I'm in, I'll say, listen, I'm I'm going to be really focused on the content. Does anyone know? anything about making sure that if the technology like if the sound system goes down now we know we've got a tech guy or a tech wo woman in the building right and they're out they're, there's there's a tech team but i say to the students who knows who knows how to fix the mic if it goes down because if it, i don't and they go oh me 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 and i say good 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 i need you to sit there then because if this if the mic goes down well i'm now it's not gonna but if it but if it does and they're like oh yes 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 i'll fix that for you and i say if the screen goes down does anybody know how the projector works? They go, oh, me, me, me. Now it's never going to happen. Famous last words. It's never going to happen. But they feel empowered because they feel like I'm trusting them with the knowledge that I know they've already got. And quite often the teachers will say, oh, yeah, yeah, if, it, if, it, if it's broken, Josh is the one to fix it or whatever. And so we give them that empowerment, give them their space, find out what where their passion lies or where their expertise lies and say, good, I need you because I don't know. But there's a wonderful educator in the, in the United States um, called Melissa Renchi, who works at Tesla STEM uh, school in the Pacific Northwest. And she has said to me for a long time, you know, she's she's very, very, very well educated, very clever um, in her own subjects and her own right. But when it comes to technology, she's sometimes she'll say to me, I'll be honest, they're telling me like we need to do coding. And I am not a coding teacher, but I've been giving the coding curriculum to run this year. And I, she says, and I just go to my seniors or I go to my, you know, eighth graders, whatever. And I say to them, 
help me make sense of this for tomorrow's lesson. Boom, they're on it. Like they are on it. Um, and she's never had she's 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 never had an unsuccessful project yet. I mean, in fact, she just keeps churning out these incredible programs. And whenever I sort of say to her, hey, that was an amazing program, she's like, Oh, it was my kids. Um, so you know, give it to the students, empower your students, they'll they'll lead this for you. Yes, I I, I cannot <laughs> say enough about that. That is into and and she is a major amazing educator. She's also a Microsoft educator expert, so she understands all of these tools and that too. But um, and, and I ex, ex, perfect example. Um, I visited a high school recently just to go off of that in the same area in Pacific Northwest, um, where they had students dive into these tools, into the Microsoft tools, and being able to put them in and and use what they had available knowing that students were going to take it to another level. And so uh, exactly what Stephen said in that empowerment, um, when you bring <laughs> in these pieces to your youth program in that and you empower your students, know that once they get engaged, it, it's going to enable them and you're going to see them empower themselves to start wanting to make decisions and to grow from there. And that's a, it's exactly what we're talking about. That's what we want. We want yeah. them to expand what it is they're doing, but they need to have that first initial initial step to get in and see how things work so that they have that opportunity um, to reflect and go to those next steps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that that feels like a, a good place to to start wrap uh, start wrapping up. So do we have any any final thoughts, Jerry and Stephen, before we, we do so? The the only thing I would like to add uh, is for your um, for the folks watching is read. If you haven't already read Jane McGonigal's Reality is Broken. Um, it's the foundation, it's the foundation that I kind of set people off onto. And I've had so many educators come back to me and say, thank you for pointing me at that book. It makes sense now. Um, because it's it's been, the premise of the book is when our reality is broken, we turn to play and and we play our way through, you know, major global catastrophes, you know, from from card games and dice games to the gladiatorial arenas of Rome to modern day game based learning. Um, and Dungeons and Dragons, um, and even to some degree, our, our 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 television watching and Netflix and the whole Marvel series and everything. It's all part of gamifying television. Um, and so, what we, if if you read uh, Reality Is Broken by Dr. Jane McGonigal, it will help. I think teachers who are not sure about where to start or why significantly the why is really to is to think about. Now, it doesn't have to be a global catastrophe. Of course, sometimes it's just that student has broken up with their girlfriend or that student has been bullied or that student has lost a parent or their parents are breaking up or something like that. And so their reality is broken. And, and what we need to do is to intervene in the right ways and play is very often that, that uh, healing and connective tissue that we, that we need. So reality is broken. Brilliant book. Um, I, I really would like to add is, Stephen and I are here. Reach out. You can find us, uh, especially on Twitter, on social media, LinkedIn. Um, yeah. Always to answer questions, where to start. You can do this. Like, yeah. start simple. We will send Josh some resources and information, especially a link to uh, Microsoft Learn, where it has that student ambassador program that we talked about, and be able to set up that club. Um, to all those leaders out there, educational leaders, uh, I, I know being an educator is the most difficult, rewarding job there is. And, and I still talk to educators and get on, and I still will be in tears at the end. Um, Josh, I recertified again. I have still have all my certifications because I just, I will never let it go. I still jump in classrooms and help co-teach. Um, so I cannot say thank you enough for all you do, um, but know that you can do this. And, and know that this is an instructional model that empowers not only your students, but your educators to be able to give them time to, to bring in personalized learning, like, and to bring in um, those, those aspects that are going to extend beyond the walls of the classroom in schools, especially if you make those connections to programs like with Idaho the Youth that you have throughout Indiana, throughout, you know, all of those youth programs, after school programs that are there and those community programs. This is a way for you to make um, and extend that community and, and that bridge, which really is about education. Education is social. So this is that one aspect that's going to bring um, everyone together and be able to get that overall outcome, which is giving students the skills and the tools they need to go to the next steps. 
right? Yeah. It, we talked a lot about those interpersonal skills and just about the learning and how to engage and bring people back in to opportunity. And I think that is probably my favorite word from this entire webinar is the word opportunity, because that is, is really what um, this is all about. And so uh, reach out to us. You can do this. We'll, 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 we are here if you have questions. Um, and I want to say thank you to um, organizations like this to allow us to come and, and um, share and talk and have this discussion, which I think helps and gives that awareness to everyone. Yes. Uh, well, we're, we're, we're appreciative that we, we have you on. And I just want to uh, first um, uh, give a plug to our weekly newsletter. Um, our weekly newsletter, it's a three to five minute read and has all of our events, all of the sort of youth worker happenings throughout um, throughout Indiana. And uh, the reason I'm giving it as a plug is because for the next few months, um, we will be uh, highlighting our Kids Count Conference in November uh, 1st and 2nd. So depending on when you're listening to this or watching this, um, you should you should go ahead and uh, find information on the Kids Count Conference on iowaad.org because Jerry and Stephen um, will be doing presentations there. So it's a good way to um, if, if this webinar was the introduction to game-based learning to esports, um, they're going to dive in a little bit deeper at the conference. So, so consider doing that. Um, and as we wrap up, I just, uh, Stephen and Jerry, I want to thank you so much for being here. Um, <clears throat> I, I definitely learned a lot in the last hour or so. Um, and it's just, it's just an exciting space and it's just a super um, exciting way to bring in curriculum, SCL, and ultimately opportunity for our youth. So um, again, thank you. We'll finish up there. Um, and we'll see you at Kids Count. Most welcome. Thank you. Looking forward to it.